Hey folks, Taylor here. Wanted to give you guys a quick disclaimer to start the show that we recorded. Uh, Obviously, all of this before the news was made official that Bruce Arena has been named the head coach of the U.S. national team, obviously replacing Jurgen Klinsmann. We will be discussing that as well as the results of tonight's, that's Tuesday night's MLS playoffs on tomorrow's show. So we'll be looking a bit more into Bruce Arena, what we expect from him, and then the MLS playoffs, the results there, all those many good things. With that in mind, here's the show. Hello and welcome to the Total Soccer Show. I am Taylor Rockwell. I am without Daryl Grove today, but I do have my dogs nearby. I say that mostly as a warning, since you're suddenly going to hear from them about four minutes into the first interview on today's show. You have been warned. Uh, Anyway, we've got an amazing program for you all today, featuring two particularly excellent guests. Up first, we've got the MLS analyst himself. It's Matt Doyle. We initially asked him to come on to preview the MLS Conference Finals, but then Jurgen went and got fired, and that sort of dominated the conversation. Still, there's a lot of good info in there about Klinsman, the U.S. national team, the cliques that seem to have formed in the locker room, and then, of course, the MLS playoffs. After that, we'll talk to Will Parchman about pretty much those exact same topics, with particular emphasis on how Jurgen Klinsmann elected to use Christian Pulisic, the road signs that let us know Klinsmann's approach wasn't working, and why Bruce Arena is a logical appointment. We also discuss some MLS action, and Will gives us insight into which teams are handling recruitment better than others. That's all coming up very soon, but first, I did want to let you all know about our schedule for this week. Uh, we're putting out this show today. We're going to do an MLS playoff review show tomorrow. That should be out tomorrow afternoon. We are going to take off Thursday and Friday for Thanksgiving and the day after Thanksgiving when you lay around in a food coma, as is tradition. So we will be back with our typical Monday show, reviewing the weekend's action, and probably still talking about Jurgen Klinsmann, maybe Bruce Arena, maybe other topics. Who knows? It's uh, a lot of time between now and then. And with that in mind, uh, here comes Matt Doyle and, of course, my dogs. Joining me now is MLS Soccer's Matt Doyle. Matthew, uh, it was already a busy time. I'm going uh, formal with the uh, the multi-syllable name. Um, But I'm guessing yesterday made your schedule even more packed. Uh, Is that fair to say? Uh, That is fair to say. Uh, I I think we all suspected this was in the works. um, And the more responsible of us had, uh, had, had... Klinsman fired. Here's the epitaph stories already banked. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I was not responsible this past weekend. I, I actually just went out drinking <laughs> for two straight days. So I was pretty hungover yesterday. And when that uh, when that news came through, I had to uh, completely sober up real quick. So we're all about uh, we're all about full disclosure on the Total Soccer Show. So thank you for that. But I did actually. <laughs> but that does bring up an interesting uh, point, which is I do feel like you've been like accused in the past of kind of campaigning against Klinsman, being anti Um and so I feel like. Some people probably think you're celebrating this news. I'm inclined to think that it's more like you were kind of calling things as you saw them and then maybe felt like you were taking crazy pills when things just continued to be as they were. So I'm wondering what your reaction was overall when you heard that news. Relief. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm relieved that I don't have to watch Jurgen Klinsmann coach <laughs> the U.S. national team anymore. And, and people can, can say that I, I campaigned against him or I hated him or whatever, but if you, if you look back at my column archive, I, you know... When he was hired, I said, this is, I think, the hire that a lot of people want. I, I think he absolutely deserves a chance. He certainly says some uh, interesting things about the state of the program, and it's probably good for the program to have an outside point of view, which is what he brought. Um, but I I was also honest from oh, about the first six months in. I said, look, he's making wacky decisions in midfield. He's playing, you know, three defensive midfielders at the same time. He's playing guys out of position. Remember, he wasn't calling in Michael Bradley, who was starting and starring for Kievo Verona in Serie A at that point. Then he spent the next year not calling in Jose Altidore, who scored, I think, 32 goals in 48 games in Holland that year. So it, it, the, the signs were there from really from late 2011 onwards. Um, And from what I have heard, uh, and this is from people I want to say maybe a step and a half or two two steps removed, Mm -hmm. um, but nonetheless, uh, from what I have heard, the the powers that be at the USSF knew they made a mistake within the first six months. Wow. Uh, Yeah. Uh, But given the... um, 
the the uh, money invested and the public relations surrounding the the whole thing um that move was never going to get made uh in, in terms of going in a new, dire- new direction with the coach. It was never going to get made except for one time. The one time it got really close was the snow game. Uh, mm-hmm. If the U.S. had not gotten the full three points out of that game, uh, that would have been it for Jurgen Klinsmann. Uh, so, I mean, that's, you know, that's the story as, as it has been related to me. It, it jives with, the, with what I've seen with my own, own eyes. I don't think Klinsmann's teams have ever played as more than the sum of their parts. I think the exact same issues that uh, he had with Bayern Munich presented themselves mm-hmm. here. Um, and I think that's why, uh, that's why he's no longer a coach of the U.S. national team. Uh, from what you know, uh, was it like one inciting incident or one specific thing in those first six months? Or was it just sort of what he was saying, not meshing with what the overall plan was or what they were seeing on the field? Uh, I think it was more the second thing. Mm-hmm. It, it was more, I mean, just gaslighting the entire soccer nation. Uh, in, in- oh, sorry. No, the <laughs> the uh, mail carrier has arrived. Give me, yeah. one, give me one second. Hey, guys, can we calm it down? Sorry about that. Yeah. So, <laughs> no, can, no can you, can you, <laughs> large, large, large dog and tiny dog. Sorry about that. Um, there's a decent chance my cats will start fighting at any minute now. <laughs> so that's that's fine. I'll, I'll see your dogs and I'll I'll raise you. Um, but no, I, I think it was, you know, saying saying one thing and doing another, giving nonsensical explanations for mm-hmm. uh, nonsensical personnel and uh, formation and, and tactical decisions. Uh, losing a lot of games. Uh, I, I mean, people don't remember this now, but I think we were like six, five, and one in his first twelve games, and most of those were not against top teams. Uh, and to the point where Sunil Gulati came out and said, "You know, this is." And this was early in, in 2012, saying, "You know, we 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 know that results matter, but." Uh, you know, we believe in the project and we're going to stick by Jurgen Klinsmann. Uh, and then Jurgen being Jurgen, he, he, I mean, the guy did have a lucky horseshoe somewhere uh, <laughs> for the first four years of his, of his reign here. Uh, but getting, you know, the dramatic equalizer from Eddie Johnson, uh, getting the Hercules Gomez 30 yard free kick goal against Jamaica, uh, I mean, in in games that the U.S. should have put away, mm-hmm. uh, just just finding a way to to eke by um, that kind of uh, dampened the uh, or, or 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 lessened the worry. Um, but I think that worry was always there for for the folks in charge. So obviously this news broke at this point less than 24 hours ago at time of recording, um, and I kind of assumed it would be maybe somewhat amicable, uh, but now it seems like we're already starting to hear a, a fair amount of dirt coming out. I'm wondering how amicable you think this split is going to be and how much more news we're going to hear kind of from behind the scenes. Well, I think we're already seeing a, a sort of a PR, um, I don't want to say blitz, but so, some uh narrative massaging from from certain parts uh and i I think that's going to continue and look jürgen klinsman is jürgen klinsman because he will say anything to anyone at any time uh whether it's true or not so you know at at some point in in the very near future uh he's gonna go you know he's gonna he he's gonna break out the flamethrower uh for (laughs) probably for Sunil Gulati and, and for U.S. soccer as a whole. And uh, I would imagine for the mentality of the fan base and for the media and all of that. Uh, and you can choose to care about that if you would like, but I don't. I, I think, I mean, I, I think Jurgen kind of proved himself to be a con man. Um, and I think, it, you know, the players won't say this on the record, but if you talk to them anonymous, anonymously or behind the scenes, uh, they will say as much. And look, I mean, Brian Strauss uh, tweeted it yesterday, uh, commenting because I, in my column, rehashing all this, I, I linked uh, Brian's old story from 2013 after that Honduras game, 
and he and he said uh, you know, he tweeted at me, I could re- just republish that story and just change the dates and it would still be exactly the same, uh, which should give you an idea of what the players think of Jurgen yeah. Klinsmann. Yeah, he's written, he's written another good one for Sports Illustrated, kind of cataloging all of the missteps along the way. And then I saw him get asked, like, do you think you're going to do a follow-up expose? And he's like, there's no need. Nothing has changed. So yeah, it does seem yep. like things were kind of at that breaking point. Uh, now Klinsman is gone. It seems very likely that Bruce Arena will be uh, coming in in his stead. That news may have already broken by the time this podcast comes out, and that's saying something, given that I'm planning to release this like in the next hour. So, <laughs> so uh, I'm curious what your thoughts are on Bruce Arena, specifically because we were pretty excited about him coming in, mostly because it felt like the ship hasn't has been basically rudderless, and any rudder is good. Uh, but we've had a lot of people say it's a backward step. We've had a lot of people, uh, you know, question some of the comments he's made in the past. Um, so I'm wondering what you think of this arena, uh, potential arena appointment, and how you would kind of respond to some of those criticisms. I think the comments that he made are totally unacceptable. Um, and I think that uh, the implication that foreign-born uh, uh, sons and or daughters of, of servicemen or, or, or you know are, are less American um, I think that's gross and I hate that he said that um, at the same time I do understand that there was a real divide in the locker room between uh, the German Americans and uh, the other um, and any coach who comes in, whether it's Bruce Arena, which it probably will be, um, or Tab Ramos, uh, or, or I guess Peter Vermees might have a chance as well, um, is going to have to deal with that. Uh, and Jurgen Klinsmann never did. So uh, I, I want to think the best of Bruce, and I want to believe that in uh, what he was saying is that uh, these guys – never saw America, the U.S. national team, as their their top choice, that we were essentially their safety school, and that uh, has a, a deleterious effect on locker room morale. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I think that people could probably agree with that. Um, but the way he phrased it uh, was, I think, entirely inappropriate, and, and I hope he addresses it and owns it and... Um, walks it back in uh, a a very real way now uh and from like i don't know bruce at all uh he 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 knows me well enough to have called me a moron um (laughs) which is absolutely fine he's not wrong about that Uh, but i know a lot of people uh from a lot of different backgrounds uh who who love bruce and you know this is includes uh, immigrants who uh, have played for him, whose children have played for him, who have coached for him. Uh, uh, and this includes, you know, Americans of uh, every background under the sun uh, who, I mean, look at the way he handled the Robbie Rogers situation. Mm-hmm. Robbie, Robbie will come out and say if, if he had to play for a different coach, it would not have been as positive or as easy as it had been. So I think, that's probably the real Bruce Arena, but he has to figure out how to how, how to marry that with his his comments. That I again, I think they were really gross. Um, as for taking a step backwards for the program, I, I can understand how people would see that way, but uh, see it that way. But if the step backwards is back towards stability mm-hmm. and back towards sanity and back towards building a core and a tactical style that gives us the the best chance of competing. And I'm not even talking it against the greatest teams in the world. I am talking now against the likes of Mexico, Costa Rica, Honduras, and Panama. Mm-hmm. Um, then that is the step I want to take because we, you know, holding by holding on to Klinsman for so long, we've reduced the margin uh, of error down to just about nil. Uh, and I, I like the fact that, um, the new coach that Bruce has so much experience uh, beating CONCACAF teams because that's job number one. Let's worry about our draw in Russia if we get to Russia. So it's interesting uh, you mentioned the locker room because 
that was kind of where we were, that we, we were confident in his experience that he's been here before, that he's kind of the one to come in and has the familiarity with the hex to get things done. But I've seen some people talking about that divide in the locker room. I honestly didn't really realize that that was a thing. So is mm-hmm. it a pretty like distinct split? Like, is there bad blood or is it just that maybe the guys who tend to speak German hang out and the guys who don't, don't? Uh, that is it. I mean, I, I don't think there, I, I have not heard it said that there is real, um, clickish bad blood, but there's just clickish clickishness. You end up trusting the guys who you spend all your time with, uh, and you end up following the leader in one group without paying attention to the other group. And that's not a team. That's two that's just groups of guys who, you know, sort of hang out together. Uh, so it's something that every player I've talked to, um, current and former, has said is an issue. Uh, now, take that with a grain of salt because I've not, there, there's not a single German American um, who I've been able to talk to about this. They're, they're very closed off with the, with the US based media, in my experience. Uh, whereas guys from uh, Liga MX uh, and guys who uh, maybe started in the U.S. and now play overseas, and of course guys in MLS, uh, are all more willing to talk. Hmm. See, this is the problem with having Matt Doyle on the show, is that we we need to talk MLS, but you say interesting things, and then we have to follow (laughs) up, and then all of a sudden... Here we are. Uh, so I know you do need to get going, but I wanted to ask you very quickly uh, about the upcoming MLS playoffs, obviously starting tonight, uh, 8 p.m., at least on my time. I know not for you. Uh, w- the playoffs are set to begin. I'm wondering if you could give us a quick idea of what you'll be watching for in Montreal v. Toronto and then Seattle versus Colorado, uh, what to watch for and what your expectations are for those games. I think Seattle versus Colorado is going to be very low scoring, and very physical, and to me, this is a game that can, I, I think it is going to be decided on set pieces. Um, and, and I think the fact that uh, Shkelson Gashi is probably out uh, puts uh, puts Colorado behind the eight ball, whereas Seattle have Nicholas Ladera. So, uh, you know, when in doubt, bet on the team that has the, the best player on the field, and that's the Sounders. As for the the Toronto-Montreal game, I think that both these teams are going to be exactly what they were in the last two rounds, which means that uh, Toronto's going to come out in that vicious 3-5-2 high pressure uh, and just try to force Montreal into mistake after mistake. Uh, and, and Montreal is going to sit. They don't precisely bunker, but they sit very deep, and they try to create space to counter into. And they've had luck with that against Toronto in the past. Uh, I, I mean, each of the last two games, uh, Ignacio Piatti ha- has scored goals that sort of come out of that stance. But look, the Red Bulls outplayed the impact. Uh, they they really should have won that series. And it was only because of poor finishing that they didn't. Um, I, I expect... Uh, Sebastian Jovinko and Josie Altador to finish better than uh, than Brad Wright Phillips and Sasha Kleshton mm-hmm. did, and that's my way of saying I, I expect that Toronto's going to win this one. So, would your if you were to get I like, guess give a prediction, would you say maybe it's uh, Seattle Toronto final? That is, I think, where the the smart money is. Mm-hmm. Um, I. I I can think of other places I'd rather be in uh, mid-December than Toronto. <laughs> but uh, que sera, sera. Uh, uh, So if these three minutes of MLS talk haven't been enough for our listeners, can you think of any possible destinations where they might be able to go to read more, to learn more about these playoff games? Oh, yeah, I can, as a matter of fact. Oh, really? You can, fo- you can follow me on Twitter, at MLS Analyst. Uh, and I have a column up today on MLSsoccer.com uh, previewing leg one. It's a tactical preview of uh, both the both the Western and the Eastern Conference Championship. You can find that armchair analyst. That's me. Uh, yeah. There we, there we go. Well, Matt, uh, from one moron to, I guess, another, though I wouldn't call you that, uh, thank you very much for taking the time to talk to us today, and uh, good, luck in the, good luck covering the playoffs and covering the uh, potential arena appointment. You got it, man. Thanks. Let's do it again soon. 
Thank you, as always, to Matt Doyle. And apologies to you MLS fans out there for the briefness of that playoff discussion. Hopefully, we will be able to make it up by having Matt back on in the very near future, either to preview the conference final second legs or maybe the MLS Cup final. We shall see what his schedule allows. While we have a break in the action, I did want to remind listeners that if they are missing the brummy tones of Mr. Grove, uh, apparently that's Birmingham slang, uh, he released a new Goldmouth episode earlier today, and it's a good one, even if it did spark considerable debate on the TSS Twitter account. If you aren't aware or haven't listened to the Goldmouth, uh, it's a podcast collaboration between us, Dirty Tackle, and Howler Magazine. It's a daily five to seven minute show that touches on the big soccer news from around the globe and also the Gilmore Girls somehow. I did also want to note that we've gotten a lot of feedback from people who either aren't too thrilled with the Klinsman firing, those have been less common, or more commonly, uh, people who aren't excited by the possible arena appointment. We haven't talked in too much detail about that yet, though Will does give us his thoughts on the matter here in just a few moments. Um, I think we will probably talk about it a bit more if and when things become official. It seems like uh, a matter of when as opposed to if. But I do think I speak for Daryl when I say that we both like Arena as a short-term appointment, even if short-term in this case likely means through the 2018 World Cup. That said, I know there are some valid criticisms out there about Bruce Arena, about some things he said in the past, about his approach to the media, even about his overall tactics and game planning, about his past history with the U.S. national team. There are many things to discuss. Uh, We will get to that probably tomorrow. I also think we would both like to see the Federation go in a different direction after the World Cup in Russia. But right now, I don't love a lot of the other options. Vermees, Kreis, and Burhalter, to name a few, have done solid work in MLS, but now isn't the time for experimentation. If things went south, that's essentially the career of a possible future coach ruined. Uh, lastly, and here I won't speak for Daryl, if only because we haven't really discussed this topic, uh, after 2018, I'm not opposed to bringing in another foreign coach. I don't personally buy into the idea that the manager has to be from the country he or she is coaching. I mean, Jill Ellis and Pia Sundhaga have proven that several times over. But I do want the future of the USMNT to be placed in the hands of a manager who's willing to innovate at times and be downright boring at others, because that's what's necessary sometimes. I honestly don't know who I want that person to be, which is why I'm not really calling for anybody in particular right now. It's why I'm okay with Bruce Arena. But I do know that I definitely wouldn't mind if it was Ted Lasso. Just kidding, that would be awful, even if I do love Jason Sudeikis. Okay, that is probably more than enough for me, so we're going to get to Will Parchman here in just one second. But first, a word from today's sponsor. On the line with me now, I've got Will Parchman, staff writer at Top Drawer Soccer. Will, thanks for taking the time to uh, talk to me this evening. Yeah, thanks for having me. Not uh, not a whole lot going on. Right <laughs> yeah, I was wondering. I appreciate that you were uh, still because we we scheduled this earlier today, uh, and then you know the news broke about Jurgen, and uh, I was wondering if you were going to have to postpone, but you did not. Instead, here we are. Yeah, I figured. Uh, I figured now is the time to <laughs> to unleash the torrent. So I figured we, we, we could get it done. So uh, we just recorded a few hours ago, Daryl and I did, uh, and one of the things we talked about in the wake of the the Klinsman, Klinsman and U.S. Soccer parting ways, I believe it was, uh, was kind of like when we both realized that we wanted Klinsman gone. And I think we were later on that bandwagon than a lot of folks. So I'm curious if you have like a specific moment or, you know, was it, was it day one or was it uh, just recently or never? No, I, I was, I was fairly, I mean, I feel like most people were, were fairly bullish on Klinsman out of the box. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, how could you not be? He's promising sort of sweeping change. And at, at the very least, he's going to, you know, look at all of these things that American soccer done. And it's easy to, to whitewash it now. But people were were kind of fatigued, you know, with Bradley Ball and you know Bruce Arena's second term from 2002 to 2006 didn't uh, it didn't end well. So I, I think people were were ready for it, and Klinsman kind of entered there with, um, you know, if if you'll excuse the political tie-in, you know, a lot of hope and change mm-hmm. uh, rhetoric, and uh, you know I, I think those first couple years people gave him a lot of leeway, and then I, I would say it, it started to change for me. Um, after 2014, where you you kind of saw them back off a little bit in the areas where I, I would really would have hoped for them to, mm-hmm. to kind of be a little bit more assertive. But I think for me, the, the time when I finally was fed up with him was the Gold Cup in 2015. Yeah. And it, it, it wasn't even the Jamaica loss to me. I mean, that was embarrassing enough. But the way they came out and played against Panama in the third place game, mm-hmm. I mean, I know, you know, nobody wants to play a third place game and you're dejected, but um the fact that they looked that bad i mean they hadn't looked that bad uh to me until the costa rica game 
the 4-0 loss. And so I, I think at, at that point, I just realized, look, if, if these players are willing to do this uh, with this coach on the sideline, I, I don't see a way forward. So there's a part of me that wonders if Daryl and I kind of like tried to stay positive with him. Like, I don't think we were looking for reasons or looking for excuses, but I do think that we maybe stayed positive than other outlets because honestly, it's easier to cover a team if you still have faith in it. Um, And I'm wondering if that made it hard for you to write about the U S team from that point onwards, kind of knowing that maybe you didn't have belief in Klinsman or you didn't think he was the one who's going to get it done. How were you able to cover them? How did you cover them with that kind of in the back of your head? Yeah, you know, it's funny covering national teams inside your country of origin because I think as, as a journalist, you know, I, I went to journalism school and you know I came up in in very sort of unbiased newspaper environments and you're it's very you're very much drilled to be you know a sort of a bipartisan observer and you know just be very cold and calculating in the way that you cover uh, the teams and, and it's kind of impossible to a full degree when you're covering the national team of your country of origin. I mean, you can tune out a lot of stuff that fans maybe can't, but at your heart, I mean, you you want to see the team do well, Um, especially in a country like the U S which is, you know, still trying to beat the drum for, you know, positive play. And, and, you know, how do we take steps forward to, you know, maybe crack into the top 10 in the world. And so for me, I feel like it was difficult because, not necessarily because I didn't like Clinton. I think he's a, you know, he seems like a fine dude and, you know, very jovial. I think I, I had a lot of issues with the way that he approaches games, but mm-hmm. I think for me, the problem was just that there was a disconnect between what he was saying and then what we seemed to see on the field. Mm-hmm. And, and it, it always seemed to be where, um, you know, the, it, everything was sunshine when he would talk and then, you know, you you would see the product and there was just no forward movement. There's no ball pressure. There's very little um, in the way of progression. And I think that was to me the most disappointing thing. So I would say I was more disappointed Mm -hmm. um, just in the way his era turned out than anything. That, that makes complete sense. And it also makes sense. What was the most frustrating for you? The, what he was saying versus what was on the field. Um, And that's actually the initial reason. I mean, we've had you on the show before. You're, you you know, you're a charming, uh, well-spoken fellow. But part of the reason why I wanted (laughs) to have you on was because of your Twitter analysis uh, last night of Jurgen's comments about Christian Pulisic or uh, Pulisic, if you want to go with the Jurgen route, and what he like thought his role was in that Mexico game. And kind of, I really enjoyed your reaction to that. So for those who might have missed your timeline, can you recap kind of what, what Klinsman was saying and then what your thoughts were on what he was saying? Well, the, the genesis of it was a Facebook chat that Klinsman gave. Mm-hmm. I want to say it was the, either the day before he was fired or the, the day before that. Yeah. Um, and, and he was basically discussing that, that infamous three-man back line that he decided to roll with um, against Mexico. And the reason he did it, uh, you know, it, out of his own, his own reckoning was to gear the whole thing around Christian Pulisic, um, which is – just beyond the pale for me. Can I, um, can I interject really quickly just to say, because I don't want you to feel like you have to toot your own horn here. Uh, you might, like Will is a person who has been, probably was the first person or one of the first people to know about Christian Pulisic, to know about like him as a player, about him with Dortmund. I feel like you have kept tabs on him longer than most people have. So when Christian, uh, when Klinsman starts talking about him, uh, I kind of immediately figured, like, ooh, that's something that is probably going to annoy people like you, like Brian Sharetta, who are very aware of what Christian Pulisic does and who he is. Yeah, I mean, if you spend any time, you know, watching him as a, as a youth international, you would say, okay, well, here's a, here's a sort of a number 10 a creative attacking midfielder in the making. Um, so it, I, I understand a part of where Klinsman was coming from, but he's been a left winger. Mm-hmm. Um, with some cameos on the right uh, for, for Dortmund since 2014. I mean, since he joined that club, he's, he's essentially, you know, where where they needed him. That's where he's been rotating in with the senior team. Um, you know, he, he has played in that 10 role with the U-17s, which, you know, he played in the, the 2015 U-17 World Cup. Mm-hmm. Uh, but he really hasn't had much time there at all. And he, he hasn't had, had any time there in a competitive match with the full national team before, um, you know, obviously they practice some with it. So the, the Klinsman rolls out this three, five, two, I think he called it like a three, one, four, two or, or whatever. Um, and so, so they, they trot this thing out and the whole thing is predicated around Polisic in the hole underneath, uh, Bobby Wood and, and Josie, I believe it was. 
And the the crux of them playing in you know in Columbus against Mexico in in a World Cup qualifier, it's the biggest game that you've had in two years and over two years. And you're going to gear the entire thing around an 18 year old who's never played in that system, let alone never played in that role on a full national team stage. That to me sort of brings out all of the naivety, the the tactical um, sort of stuff that Klinsman just throws against the wall. And then, you know, he, he almost gets uh, acts like he's being put upon when, when, you know, people are critical of it. And, And I think that to me was, one of the irredeemable factors about Klinsman's era is that he's just so tactically naive mm-hmm. and he showed it over and over and over again in big moments. He just made strange decisions that he couldn't back up and almost just denied that they, you know, that they happened the way that people saw that they happened. So that to me, I mean, yes, Christian Pulisic is a 10 and I, I hope that he, he rotates into that role, but to do it in that way was just a setup for failure. Cause yeah, I mean, it sets Pulisic, I would say, up for failure immediately. But I also wonder uh, if you have thoughts on what that would do for the team. Because it's a lot of these guys, you know, they've yeah. had long, you know, relatively storied club careers. And I imagine they're used to having, like, strong tactical plans and an idea for how to play and clear ideas, as Michael Bradley called it. So to be sitting in that locker room and have Klinsman say, like, okay, here's the plan. Get the ball to Christian and he'll do stuff. And then everybody else yeah. defend with three defenders. I imagine that would have a very deflating kind of depressing effect on the team. Do you think that's fair to say, or do you think it was just more something that they were all knew was going to happen and maybe went into hesitantly, but aware of the fact that Klinsman was the coach? I have to think that at this point, all of those guys in the locker room, because they've all played for Klinsman for a while now, Mm -hmm. most of them, uh, I have to think they have some sort of Klinsman callus, I guess you could call it, (laughs) like a built up thing where, where they just sort of expect the unexpected when it comes to Klinsman. So I'm sure, especially Bradley, who's seen a little bit of everything, I'm sure that when Klinsman trotted out this formation in, in practice for the first time, I'm not sure when the first time they did it, but it couldn't have been that far um, you know, before the game. I, I, I imagine they, you, know, you might have gotten some internal head rolls, but you know, they're, they're dutiful guys, and they'll go about their job and, and, and do it the best they can. But the way they played sort of showed you, I think, some of the frustrations that were probably probably went unsaid, I would say. Uh, you know, obviously with not just Pulisic, but, you know, you, you had Timmy Chandler on the right playing this sort of weird wingback mm-hmm. role, and it he, he sort of got filleted by Miguel Leun, and, you know, Omar's having to step over now and play in this sort of pseudo right-back role that didn't suit him, and it was just a mess. And, you know, I thought Pulisic had a pretty good game all things considered but you know Bradley and and Jermaine Jones neither of them really stepped up to him and and you know there there were no none of those tight triangles those passing triangles that you like to see and it it was just sort of it looked as haphazard as I'm sure it felt on the field so yeah actually I wanted to talk to you about that as well because you mentioned Bradley and Jones and it seems like in the wake of these defeats there were kind of three schools of thought one was this is Klinsman's fault one was, this is the player's fault, and some of them need to be held accountable. And then the third would be some combination of the two. Regardless, we got a lot of uh, emails and tweets about how Michael Bradley needs to be dropped, how he's not that good anymore, how he isn't playing up to his potential. The same goes for Jermaine Jones. So I'm wondering where you fit in those debates, uh, the Bradley debate and the Jermaine Jones debate. And I'm wondering if you have thoughts on maybe what their future might be with this national team and the, uh, the incoming coach, whoever that might be, Bruce Arena, whoever it could be. Uh, I'm wondering if you, who you th- how you think they'll uh, fit in. Yeah, I think speaking broadly, I mean, certainly not all of the blame goes to Klinsman. I mean, you, you have to saddle some of it um, on, you know, Bradley or Jones or whoever it may be. But I do think that it's not a coincidence that every – not every, but I would say 90 to 95% of the players called in to these camps and, and for these games tend to play worse under Klinsman than they do for their clubs. And that is 100% the case with Michael Bradley right now. Because if, if anybody's watched him with Toronto FC this year, you know, he, he may not be, you know, hitting that Roma form that he had, you know, three, four, five years ago. Uh, but he's playing about as well as he has since he moved to the U S um, you know, he's kind of in a, a little bit of a, a shuttler role for, for Greg Vanny in Toronto, 
um, which is similar to what, you know, what Klinsman's asking him to do, even if it's not his strength. But you watch him dropped into what Klinsman's doing. You've got Jermaine Jones, who's played at times the 10 role in Colorado, which is just bizarre that, that that's worked at all. Um, and so it just sort of, you know, he's sort of all over the place and, you know, his, his passing is erratic and sometimes he chooses to lay it off to Bradley and sometimes he dumps like a 30 yard long ball up to somebody and it doesn't really find. So I think Bradley has always been uncomfortable next to Jermaine Jones. I think it's, it's just the reality of their skill sets. And so I think he needs somebody who's willing to drop in next to him and play and then have that. Christian Pulisic drop back in and so that they can sort of start to build a little bit and maybe he can get, 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 you know, get in those runs in behind um, that he's, you know, he's been asked to do so often. So I, I, th- I think that's part of it where, um, you know, they, they don't look very good together. And so therefore they don't look good individually. And I think Bradley's fine. I, I don't think he should be dropped. And I, I certainly don't think Bruce arena um, will, will, will do that. But I do think, Arena's just more, he's a more practical guy. You know, Arena's going to come in and, and kind of try to write the ship a little bit. He's going to listen to Michael a little bit more than, than, than Jurgen did. He's going to let him play into his strengths. And, and that'll go for all the guys. I, I would expect, a, you know, that American 442 that he likes to run. And um, it, it won't be anything revolutionary, but I, I don't think the U.S. needs that. I just mm-hmm. think they need some stability. Yeah, so you mentioned Bruce Arena. Uh, earlier you mentioned that his second term didn't end too well. Uh, I'm wondering what, you th- what your predictions are for his third term. Uh, maybe not predictions, but what are some reasons you have for optimism and maybe some reasons for skepticism or trepidation? I think it's fair to be skeptical um, of Arena, partly because he's kind of set in his ways at this point, um, tactically. And he's never been a tactical maestro. I mean, if even if you look you know, down in, uh, into his his best years around 2002, when 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 he was coaching the the U.S. to the brink of you know World Cup semifinal, he, he was just very practical. He's a pragmatic guy. I mean, he'll he'll put guys out on the wings that need to be on the wings, and you know he's not going to reinvent the wheel. Um, and you know, from that aspect, I think the U.S. could use somebody who's a little bit more tactically astute because they do have a lot of. I think Klinsman left them in a weird place. Mm-hmm. They have a lot of sort of disparate pieces um, all over the field that have been used bizarrely. And so I think they could maybe use more of an ideologue to sort of um, stretch those pieces into something interesting. But I, 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 by the same token, I can totally see why why he's a good pick because he will sort of bring that that stability over the next two years. He's a great locker room coach. You know, players love him for a reason just because he's no nonsense. He won't jerk you around. Um, which I feel like Klinsman was guilty of uh, often. He's not going to, yeah. you know, lay you out in the press. Um, he's not. He's not going to push push you under the bus. He's going to take a bullet for you. So, um, I, I think from a player standpoint, they'll be excited, if for no other reason than because they'll, you know, they'll just have a new vantage. They'll have more excitement. Um, they'll just be a little bit, a little bit of a different swagger. I, I feel like about them with, with, with Bruce. Now, uh, the one thing that I've seen a lot with Bruce Arena. Um, and probably pertains pretty directly to a lot of the guys on this team, are those quotes from 2013. I know you've uh, talked a little bit about this or uh, tweeted a little bit about this. Uh, the one, the major one to question would be, players on the national team should be American. If they're born in other countries, we aren't making progress. Uh, I know he's kind of clarified that since then, but I'm wondering, do you think those quotes are going to come back to bite him, or do you think that's something that he's going to have to kind of deal with in these first few months if he is indeed the manager, which it looks likely that he will be? I think he'll be asked about it. Um, maybe, you know, in in the first or second, maybe even third press conference, um, after he he takes the job, but I don't, I don't see this as being an issue at all. Mm -hmm. Um, I I can, I can already see him kind of smacking it down with that sort of, you know, deadpan Bruce arena (laughs) look that he likes to give reporters. Um, but no, I, I really don't see an issue in it at all. Um, yeah, as you mentioned, he did clarify them a little bit just to kind of, um, let people know he's not being a xenophobe. He's not saying that we shouldn't have dual nationals, but I completely got his point that, you know, I, I, I'm not sure exactly what he meant by, um, you know, the, the first sentence, the, you know, they should be American, but certainly his second point um, when he's talking about, we're not making progress. Um, if, if, you know, if we, if we don't have guys raised here on the team and he's right because the Fabian Johnson doesn't reflect the American soccer development apparatus. 
he's a fantastic player. He deserves his spot on the field. He, he's worked hard for everything he's gotten, and I absolutely have no problem with him starting. But at the same time, I think it's fair to say, well, we, we can't develop a player that can knock him out of that role. Um, you know, the Columbus crew or, you know, LA Galaxy or, or the Sounders or whoever. And I think that's a, it's just a fair assessment to say, um, you know, a, a guy like Jermaine Jones doesn't reflect the American development system because he, he wasn't developed here. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's where I think Arena was going with it, just to say, you know, we can only affect change here with our development academies. And so to have better players coming out of those academies at all times that, you know, to have guys that, that can fit in on a national team, I think that's where he was kind of going with it and not this sort of rhetoric of, you know, oh, we, we should only have natural born mm-hmm. Americans born inside the 50 States. I, I, I don't see it that way. So you, you think hugs with Jermaine Jones, are like uh, first on the menu. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if he even calls Jermaine in, we'll see. We'll see how that goes. That's actually, and that was my other question I had for you about Arena. Do you think there are players that he maybe will bring back in from the cold? Uh, might consider calling that Jurgen Klinsmann didn't, or maybe are there names that he won't be calling anymore? Uh, in your opinion, I think some of the old guards. So, like, I I can see him um, getting rid of Jermaine Jones, who hasn't really been effective um, for a while. He, he had a he had a good uh, Copa America, but I think that was kind of an anomaly. Um, certainly cutting ties, I think, with guys like Graham Zusi. Um, Matt Beasler might get call in, but certainly not at left back. Um, but I, I think the guys that he goes after, I mean, there's no reason um, not to look at Benny Failhaber again. Um, you know, it, it'll be it'll be contingent on form at the very least. It won't be, you know, there won't be some strange shadow grudge there. Um, but Failhaber, Dax Bacardi, how Kyle Beckerman has routinely been getting call-ups over Dax, McC- or over Dax McCarty for the last two or three years when, when Dax has been on better form since, you know, the, the World Cup ended and is beyond me. Um, so that, that should definitely change. And then uh, Matt Hedges, you know, guys like that um, who, who haven't really gotten run-ins uh, with the national team. I, I, I just think the MLS guys mm-hmm. will perk up a little bit just because I don't, I don't think Klinsman really regarded them um very highly all right well speaking of major league soccer we've got that to talk about as well um i did see someone on twitter i can't remember who it was so i apologize uh if you were a listener uh, pointing out that since the last uh, mls playoff game donald trump was elected president leonard cohen died the usa lost to mexico and costa rica and klinsman was fired so it seems like there's been a lot oh. going on since uh since the last playoff game um, and they kind of feel like a distant memory at this point. They tend to be very much about momentum. When teams hit stride, they tend to find form. They tend to get results. So I'm curious, first off, what impact you think the international break is going to have on uh, the remaining teams in MLS playoffs? Actually, I, I don't think it'll be a huge impact. Um, the playoffs are such a, a grinding um, sort of, I don't want to say toss-up, but, but it's it kind of like a toss-up um, anyway. So I, I don't think another week would really affect that too much. I mean, certainly the Sounders weren't too happy to see it just because they had been on such red hot form. Mm-hmm. Um, TFC too, I, you know, I'm, I'm sure that they would have much preferred to have a, you know, a game straight away. But you know, at the same time with the, with the playoff format like it is, um, I don't, I don't really see any of these teams, you know, not being able to, to pick up where they left off. Um, that said, I, I think mostly teams are happy because you know it allows them to heal up a little bit um i think every all four teams have had some injury um injury woes that they were you know more than happy to have you know the week and a half two week layoff to you know sort of heal up and get ready for for this final push yeah i feel like with that in mind seattle fans should probably at least have one fond mem- memory of Jurgen klinsman in that he selected tim howard <laughs> tim howard tours of dr muscle uh won't be able to play against the sounders how happy do you think seattle fans are with that news obviously i'm sure they love timmy howard but i'm sure they love not having yeah, to play yeah, against yeah. him yeah yeah I, I think not only howard i think what sounders fans should be more interested in is the Schkels and Gashi um, news. Uh, he, he, uh, he finished the, the second leg against the galaxy on crutches. Um, and Pablo said uh, late last week that he was doubtful um, mm-hmm. for Tuesday's game. So I think Gashi is far more integral um, to what the Rapids do 
um, than Howard is. Not that Howard's not been been huge in in mm-hmm. his time, but uh, people forget the Rapids also had the number one defense in the league when when Zach McMath was back there. So um, now that said, you're you're asking a, a guy to come back in, you know, after three and a half four months on the bench, and so um, you know that's not ideal either. But you know the the Rapids were already sort of appealed back defensive team anyway. If you take Gashi out of there, I'm, I, they may they might just drop you know all eleven guys behind the ball in in Seattle and just hope for a draw. Um, so we talked a little bit about Colorado's. I know Seattle also have some injury concerns of their own. Uh, you got Jordan Morris, you got uh, Ivan Schitz, Fernandez, Torres. Uh, I guess Dylan Remick is also maybe has cut some concussion issues. So I'm mm-hmm. wondering if yep. you think who of those guys you think it might miss out or who should be good to go. Well, Roman Torres played 90 for, for Panama last week. So I, he's, unless something strange happens on the, on the way to the game, he'll, he'll be in there next <laughs> to Chad Marshall. Um, I, I don't know about, about Jordan Morris. He, he was a limited participant in practice, so, so he might not be, be completely ready, um, completely ready yet. But um, as for Alvaro Fernandez, pretty sure he's not going to make it, but, but Ivan Schitz has been, been, been fully uh, participating as well. So, um, a little good, a little bad, but but I think that Roman Torres news is, is huge because honestly, if he plays the full season, you know he, he's an easy you know top three defender of the year kind of kind of pick. So we've talked, I think, like specifically about Seattle and Colorado like players and uh, expectations, but we haven't really talked about what your expectations are for the overall game, both this one and the uh, I guess the Canadian Classico, or I'm sure there's many many terms for it that I'm missing. But what are your expectations for both of these games? Well, as for the West, I think this is the best chance the Sounders have ever had at an MLS Cup, and the very least to make it there. Um, you know, Colorado's beat up, as we've said, but, um, you know, this team is, they're not going to do anything special. They're just going to look to grind out this series. They're, they're going to shut up shop in Seattle, and they're going to try to, you know, I, I would say a 0 0 draw. Pablo would be utterly ecstatic about that because teams don't win in Colorado. I mean, they they're literally hasn't, one has not won. Um, at altitude all year so uh, the Sounders I, I would say they need to get you know two goals to feel feel really good about it but um, Seattle, Seattle's got to be the favorite I mean you, you kind of have to throw out seeds in MOS this time of year cause none of that really matters um, you know and, and as for the East I think Toronto FC is the best team in the field right now um, if if Montreal is able to to close down Sort of that that Josie uh, Giovinco pairing. Then no, I mean they're they're doing something that no team has done in the playoffs this year because they're they've just been red hot. So mm-hmm. I would uh, I would expect to see Seattle Toronto um, with, with that game obviously being in Toronto in the final, um, and then maybe Toronto nipping it. But you know it's it's anybody's game I think. Uh, I did have one more question for you, uh, and I'm hoping you can shed some insight. It seems like, generally speaking with Major League Soccer, mid-season additions aren't the best idea. Now, that might be just because it's usually like big names coming in after long seasons in the Premier League or elsewhere. Um, but this season, Mateo Mancosu and then Nico Lodero have seems like very much bucked that trend. So uh, is there something that makes them unique, or is it just that they came in and clicked right away? I think it, it a part of it is tied to... Um, their just their their status, their name. I mean, these guys. It, it's not they're not 35 years old coming into the league. That I, I think both entered MLS with something to prove. And I think part of that for Ladero is just um, his mindset. I think you know he he asked MLS for an MLS Live subscription before he came. I mean, how many designated players do that? Um, but I think both of them were just invested before they even got here. And so that that helps. So regardless of whether they started at mid-season or, or the beginning of the season, I think both were kind of destined to do that. But I think you're also seeing, you know, a shift in MLS DP practices where teams, you know, they're doing a little bit more personality scouting now. I mean, not, obviously not all teams, but um, they're trying to find out if these guys are, are, are in. Because, because I think there have been more talented players than Nico Ladero um, DP-wise. But there have been, I mean, watch Ladero play um, in this series, and you'll see, I mean, he's just, he's going after every ball, he's tracking balls down, he's, he's making, you know, a ton of just tiny little minute decisions every game that, honestly, a lot of DPs don't feel like they have the time to do. And so I, I think if you can find a guy on the transfer market, whether they're, you know, four to six million a year or, 
you know, a TAM guy who's, you know, 800 to 1.2 mil or, or whatever. Um, if you can find a guy, interview him, get, you know, get a sense of, of his mindset. Is he going to come in with, you know, guns blazing from the, from the jump? And, and that wasn't something that was ever really important to teams until recently. And I think you're seeing now that teams are having success with that formula, you're seeing more, more and more teams go towards maybe this guy doesn't have the international profile of Steven Gerrard, but he's way more invested in this league and he can help us positionally more. I do want to let you go eventually. I do have one more question just based off what you just said. With the personality scouting, uh, and it sounds like kind of like innovative uh, recruitment policies, you said some are doing it, some aren't. Who would you say are the the better teams in terms of like employing those sorts of tactics to find diamonds in the rough or players who've maybe uh, been overlooked elsewhere? Well, I think you're looking at two of them in particular um, in, the, in the final four field in, in Seattle, <clears throat> Seattle or Montreal. Montreal signing of, of Ignacio Piatti was, you know, one of the most brilliant moves in the league. And, and not many people in MLS knew much about him, but Piatti fit their scheme. He was in a position of need. He's in a position of scarcity in MLS. And he has been unbelievable, maybe the most unheralded player in the league. Um, and then obviously the Sounders with Ladero. Um, and then, you know, the, the Morris signing, which, which turned out to be a, you know, a coup. So, um, I, I think the Red Bulls did a great job with, with Sasha Kleshton. You know, not many people were sure what, what they were getting with him, but he's mm-hmm. a, a Jesse Marsh guy. Um, FC Dallas, Mauro Diaz, uh, yeah. guys like that. Um, obviously, FC Dallas, I mean, they just do a great job finding South American talent. Uh, yeah. Michael Barrios. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you, you, you can tell the, you know, the, the teams that, that still want to splash with a 35-year-old, but definitely teams are, are, are moving away from that, which is great to see. Yeah, I think Daryl, on more than one occasion, has gone through the rosters of some of the teams you've mentioned just to see if there are any potential dual nationals in there because there do seem to be a lot of uh, good players. <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty sure he's checked yeah. Mauro Diaz at least three times at this point. Same yeah, goes for... Uh... Maybe... Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, maybe keep checking. There may be something there. <laughs> I think it was it was him and Diego Chara. Diego Chara has definitely been investigated by Daryl Grove at least three times. Uh, no di- right. No dice there, though, unfortunately. But... Uh, Many dice here because Will Parchman, that was wonderful. So, Will, thanks so much for taking the time. If people want to read more from you, hear more from you, uh, where can they find you? Oh, boy. Um, <laughs> top Drawer Soccer, SoundersSC.com. I've got a, a weekly column now at, at MLSsoccer.com. Um, comes out on uh, either Tuesday or Wednesday, so um, catch me there as well. And I'll have a uh, story uh, on my time in, in, uh, in Germany coming out in the next uh, Haller magazine as well. So Beautiful. And at Will Parchman on Twitter, is that correct? You, you got it. Beautiful. All right, well, Will, thanks so much. Enjoy the playoffs, and uh, hopefully we will talk to you again soon. Cheers. Thanks for having me.